Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back to the NPTEL lecture series on bioelectricity. So, today we will be starting our 10th lecture. So, in the last lecture we talked about uh, in details about microelectrode array, the planar microelectrode arrays. So, we talked about how this planar microelectrode arrays could be used in drug discovery, understanding the neuronal circuit and understanding cardiac action. So, yesterday I showed you a circuit in that where I showed that you know you can make a small circuit with defined number of neurons. Similarly, you can place uh, there are a few other modifications what you can do you could recreate say for example, we know that the cardiac myocytes or the heart cells are being regulated by sympathetic and parasympathetic neuron. So, do the muscle cells are being regulated by motor neuron. So, what you can do by the same, same patterning techniques you can rebuild those circuits. So, something like this say for example, if, uh, if I call this uh, okay. if, if these are the cardiac myocytes you know the beating cardiac myocyte and we know these cardiac myocytes are being innervated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons. Okay. So, what we can essentially do we can really study. So, if uh, let us just move that. If these uh, cardiac myocytes and uh, these are the parasympathetic and sympathetic circuit. So, these sympathetic parasympathetic circuit actually regulates the cardiac myocyte. So, what essentially do you can translate this whole thing on in a microelectrode array to study the exact mechanism what is happening. So, in order to do that what you have to do say for example, you have an array like this out here and you have these electrodes sitting all over the place like this. You can make these arrays custom made you can. So, I am just uh, drawing a limited number of arrays in order to and say for example, you have a physical barrier like this. So, that the cells on the other side cannot move to this side whereas, the only the processes can move okay. something like a physical barrier like this. So, what you do okay. So, you take the cardiac myocytes and you start growing the cardiac myocyte on this other side. Okay. So, these are the cardiac myocytes which are growing. these cardiac myocyte cannot move on to the other side, because you have created a barrier. So, that these cells cannot move whereas, you put your sympathetic parasympathetic neuron likewise, but the process can really travel to this side. Okay. Similarly, you have essentially what you are doing you are recreating that circuit of control of sympathetic and parasympathetic to the cardiac uh, myocyte or in other word you can study the heart physiology cardiovascular physiology on a small chip or a microelectrode chip. And these are the power of these kind of simple system where you can. So, what you essentially can do you can say for example, you can stimulate this say uh, you stimulate this and uh, stimulate this electrode out here and you could see the response out here 
you will be able to see the see the kind of response which is taking place on this electrode on this electrode or wherever. Okay. So, you could have a one to one connection between it. So, this side is showing just for you the parasympathetic I am showing by or sympathetic or parasympathetic neurons and on the other side you have the cardiac system. Okay. And these kind of devices are called biohybrid devices and these biohybrid devices are nothing but where there is electronic component are being integrated with the biological component and that leads to a marriage of these two diverse system in order to extract meaningful information out of it, which could be used for several purposes. I mean look at this system, this could be used for I mean wide array, this could be used for drug discovery one of the major areas, this could be used for a, a chronic studies, a long term effect of drugs or something like that, this could be used for understanding network, which is a very challenging task in a real life situation, you really cannot. And basically what you can do, you can add component by component into these kind of circuits to do. Similarly, you can build another circuit like you could have. So, we know that most of these motor neuron from the spinal cord are the ones which are innervating all your uh, skeletal muscle. If, if these are your skeletal muscle which are sitting out here like this with you know, So, how to build these kind of circuits? So, again the similar way you can translate them on a micro electrode array the way I was showing you. If this is the array and again you create partition, you can really custom made all these things and you have the electrode sitting like this. Like this the electrodes are sitting all over the place and here you are going growing the muscle cells like this okay. and the gap is so much that it would not allow really and you can actually pattern these substrates in such a way that they will only go grow in a certain fashion as I have already discussed to you with you people about the pattern and here the cells will and here they are forming the neuromuscular junction something like this. So, these are the power of these kind of systems. So, basically what you can do out here you can stimulate the individual motor neuron and you can see the response out here in the muscle. So, you have in your control now the, the individual synapses. So, you can really access the individual neuromuscular junction or NMJ or neuromuscular junction synapse. So, these are the reductionist approach to study bioelectrical events which are responsible for our very core of our survival. And these not only helps you to understand circuit as I was mentioning you, there are a whole plethora of other applications. This is this is an upcoming rising area a bi hybrid devices which uh, uh, can change the way we think. Another approach is now what is the next level of development which is taking place whenever you look at these kind of arrays, these are flexible arrays. So, these are flexible arrays. So, now what you can do essentially is these flexible arrays now they are a materials by which you can make uh, these non flexible arrays you can make them flexible arrays. Flexible micro electrode arrays MEAs. Okay. These flexible MEAs could be implanted directly into the nervous system or, or any other excitable systems of the body. 
So, the you can really roll them up, you can put it there and they have they are finding in future they will rather they will find applications in terms of prosthesis, in terms of wide range of applications which as of now is kind of out of uh, like you know it is tough to comprehend at this time, but these are the areas which are going to change the way we study uh, biological systems. Though these are very reductionist approach, but they give very profound information, very clean information uh, with least amount of noise in them. Okay. So, with this uh, uh, understanding of microelectrode arrays, I will move on to the patch clamp technique. So, before I start the patch clamp technique, so let us get some of the timeline right what happened when during last. So, if you go back and if you look the way if this is the I am drawing the x axis and I am showing you the time. So, somewhere 1700 or 1800 this is the time when there were preliminary understanding. So, people have understood bioelectricity was pretty much there all over the place and somewhere down out here somewhere out here by electricity was discovered. Okay. Followed by that people were starting to do a whole bunch of uh, started doing sharp and, and during this time of course, this gives birth to the whole field of electrical engineering. If you go back to the time of uh, Volta Galvani during the time well there was no formalized discipline called electrical engineering and people were discovering charges and all these kind of things and it is during that time that bioelectricity was discovered as a matter of fact some of the bioelectrical phenomena were discovered much earlier than formalizing the whole field of electrical engineering okay so after that during 1800 there were people who were doing sharp electrode, they were trying to I mean, pushing electrode and with voltmeter they were trying to make recordings and everything. During early 1900, so this is the time when late 1800 and 1900, this is the time plant bioelectricity was discovered and plant and will be of course, will be dealing with this whole section, there is a whole section in this course will be dealing with it. And the pioneer in this was Sir J. C. Bose. He worked extensively on Mimosa, Touch Me Not plant, and several other uh, related uh, plants which show electrical activity, and published his seminal contribution and pretty much proved beyond doubt these plants have plants exhibit bioelectrical phenomena. Okay. So, in one way it can be said those were the systematic beginning of understanding bioelectricity early half or later half of 18th century and as a matter of fact the that is the same time the pretty much out here just for later half of the 18th century when the discovery of galena as semiconductor and as a matter of fact semiconductor concept of semiconductor came even earlier than that uh, by the first such evidence which could not be described was was shown by Michael Faraday. He really could not explain he saw some uh, deviation from the known Ohm's law you know there was a very unusual deviation nonlinear relation started picking up he could not explain it. It was after that the semiconductor was being discovered and uh, I am I'm forgetting the name of the individual I will get back to you with that. And then it was the discovery of Galena as a functional device. So, this was basically what he showed is a, what Bose showed is a functional device, but after this he moved on to the plant and made some annual contribution in understanding plant bioelectricity. And as a matter of fact he was the first one to propose that plants have life actually. 
that was the time it was kind of you know out of the world and how it could be said that the plants have life. He pretty much showed that they generate action potential like impulses and those were recorded and uh, that was pretty much a systematic beginning. Then on during this part 1900 to 1950 I should say is the time when there was enormous work happened across Europe on animal bioelectricity. A systematic study, mind it these studies were going on, it is not that systematic studies were being done. Some of the I should say some of the very hallmark was the discovery of action potential by Hodgkin and Huxley. There are several other people whose name I am not mentioning here, but that does not mean their contribution or any less. It is just I am just trying to build up the story how the patch clamp came into being. But even Hodgkin and Huxley they use sharp electrodes which I have shown you before earlier. So, you have this cell and you have a sharp electrode and you are making recordings uh, as a voltmeter or whatever. Okay. But based on their action potential traces they did a complete mathematical formalism of what they believed is something like when the membrane is kind of you know becoming short. But then the suspicion that there are entities like ion channels. So, there was no ion channels which was known and mind it this is the time when uh, not a single protein was kind of crystallized. It was the time when Max Perutz was trying to crystallize hemoglobin. Today you see all, mm, so many proteins which have been crystallized and all those things and forget about membrane protein those are not even clear. And it was the time when the most famously celebrated model of uh, you know, very uh, the fluid mosaic membrane model that was not possible. I mean it was kind of it was not really clear at that time what is the structure of the membrane. So, essentially what we did not know at that time was if this is a cell the structure of the membrane was not clear. So, and this is I am talking about 1940s membrane structure was not clear, the ultra structure was not known, proteins crystallization has not taken place. So, really we have no idea much much idea about protein just recently DNA was discovered. So, this is I am talking about 1940s and 50s ok. DNA was discovered by Watson and Crick ok. And it was the time when action potential was discovered, but nothing was clear that there are ion channels and all those things which we talk so easily nowadays was was like you know could be an could be at that time could be a like you know very daring dream and that is what pretty much Hodgkin Huxley did they in their mathematical formalism came up with you know there are possibilities there are specific channels through which the ion passes and likewise so on and so forth. It was purely mathematical based on certain experimental data. Then came the next breakthrough in 1970s with the discovery of a technique called patch clamp. And so, if I go back in the timeline chart, so the next discovery was here 1970. And in between there is one discovery out here, which is very significant, though nothing to do with biology, though but it played a significant role out here that is this zone, because this is the time when semiconductor was discovered and they go all hand in hand. Semiconductor discovery 
by Bardeen, Britain and Shockley. It was during that time that opened up a floodgate of developing silicon based devices. Mind it semiconductor, sorry I am wrong here just let me correct it, crystalline semiconductor. Okay. So, semiconductor was known much earlier than that, but what was what was the breakthrough out here was the crystalline silicon using crystalline silicon and this was the discovery which was made in Bell Labs in New Jersey. So, this discovery changed the way we perceive the world. There are certain discoveries which totally change everything and this is one discovery, but how this discovery has to do with what we know today about ion channels or by electricity. So, the connection is fairly straightforward, because of the discovery of semiconductor this leads to development of electronic devices, which are much more profound as compared to previously when people were using germanium and all those kind of you know, where the signal, signal acquiring fidelity is fairly low and all those, but here there is a scope that you could really acquire very profoundly good signal. So, that leads to the development of very high precision during this period, it opened up a floodgate for the development of very high gain electrometer, electrometers and amplifiers. And this, so those of you who have forgotten electrometer, if you remember that you could measure charges using a gold leaf foil, that is where they use electrometer. Okay. So, this was the time which was a really very amazing time, where like you know some of the path breaking discovery discoveries took place and the whole field was kind of rocking and with the discovery of very high gain amplifiers. So, one of the challenge you have to realize that you are measuring current at nano ampere, pico ampere dimensions, it is not easy, it is very noisy, you really have to have a very good hold or understanding about the phenomena, otherwise you will be recording noise. So, it is during that time, this discovery of these high end amplifiers and simultaneously it was during that time pretty much around 70s on this is the time which saw the next development I will come back to this when and they all have played very significant role to what you people see today is with computers. It is the time when computers were slowly coming into existence. Okay. So, with the discovery of crystalline silicon as a material semiconductor material for device development, followed by development of very high end amplifiers for these kind of recordings, the stage was set for the next discovery and the next discovery was what I started going to start is the, the, study, the discovery of patch clamp, but then the venue shifted all the way to Germany, uh, two gentlemen, two Germans. Irwin Nihar and Bert Sackman, they were instrumental in developing patch clamp technique. What essentially patch clamp is all about? So, if if this is a cell, okay, so we are talking about fine. This is a cell, and these are the these are the ion channels on the cell this green and millions of such ion channels all over the cell. Now, what you wanted to understand is you want to access or you want to measure the current flowing through these ion channels. Okay. 
it could be a potassium channel, it could be a sodium channel, it could be a calcium channel, it could be a chloride channel. So, your goal is this, you want to see, see the movement like this or you want to measure the movement like this or say like this or this. So, you to measure these ionic fluxes. So, in order to understand that, you have to really come close, so that you can access an individual ion channel, how to do so. So, what was being done by Nihar and Sackman is, so Irwin Neher and the segment. What they essentially do is they, they develop this nice glass pipe. So, how they did it? let us understand it first. So, you have this, you all have seen a capillary. So, here you have a capillary tube. Okay. Now, I take the capillary tube and keep it in a without touching and keeping it at a very hot coil. If you keep it in a hot coil, so this is a whose temperature you can control. And on these two sides, you have two clamps by which, so for example, these are the clamps by which you can pull this on two direction, on, on either direction. So, now what will happen when you will expose it to a very high temperature, this will start to melt like this. Okay. And then, if you give a very strong pull on either side, just for your understanding sake. So, you have this, this coil. Okay. Now, if you give a very strong pull, what you will be essentially landing up with is this. depending on the strength of the pull, it will be landing up with a narrow bore or a thick bore glass pipette like this. This is what I was trying to draw here, which is essentially like this. Okay. This is what you are going to land up with. Now, the if you look at the diameter of these kind of glass pipe it, there will be approximately around 1 micron or micrometer or maybe 0 0.5 micrometer likewise. Okay. And mind it, if you look at the cell as compared to this, which is 22. 30 micron or even sometime maybe 35 to 40 micron. The bigger, the better off you are in terms of picking up signal. So, now what essentially you can do with that small tip, you can access at least a 1 micron patch of a cell and mind it, what is the name? And the name is patch clamp. So, in other words, what you are trying to do by this word, what this word says, you are taking a small patch of the cell like this and you are clamping it or you are you know holding it. So, you are holding a small patch of a cell and in that small patch of a cell, you are manipulating the membrane properties along that small patch and that is why it is called patch clamp and what all you can hold 
there are only two parameters I will come to the whole electronic configuration, but let us understand it. There are two things you can hold here if you go by the most fundamental law V is equal to I R you can either. So, where V is your voltage I is your current and R is your resistance. So, there are only two things you can hold here you can either hold the voltage or you can hold the current. When you clamp in that zone you can hold the voltage this is called voltage clamp, because you are holding the voltage or the voltage is in your control you can change the voltage you can clamp it at different level minus 80, minus 70, minus 60, minus 50, minus 40, minus 30, minus 20, minus 10, 0 likewise you can hold the voltage or you can clamp the current, which is called current clamp. So, current clamp is essentially you can inject a finite amount of current to the preparation through that electrode. Now, what we will do we will. So, so essentially you would see patch clamp with a so if I kind of give a graphical sum summary of this. So, you have patch clamp and under patch clamp you have voltage clamp or you have current clamp. Okay. Now, with this background I will move on to the next phase, where we will be talking about how these circuits are being built, how these are being dealt and all other details. So, today we will close in here and in the next class we will move on and we will talk about in depth about the circuits. Okay. Thanks a lot.